Wow, what an incredible crowd on a Tuesday night. Wow, what an incredible atmosphere. You know, I'm 65 years old and been going to church about four or five times a week. And I'm going to tell you, there's nothing, be- there's nothing worse than being in church when God's not there. And there's nothing better and sweeter than being in the presence of God. How many love the presence of God? I, I cherish it. I love it. And it's such a great honor. I know that when a guest like me steps in, there's that little bit of a disappointment that your pastor's not here. But I thank you for trusting me as he has trusted me to spend some time together and, and to release a word to you. I want to first of all say uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. The hope movement of which is touching millions and millions of people's lives through the instrument that God has used in Joel. You guys are such a great part of that. You have been such a great support emotionally, the friendship, and the sowing into uh, the message of hope. Two things I want to warn you. When you get to heaven, you're going to get a lot of people going to come up to you, hugging you, looking to give you a high five, and you're going to be like, who are you? And they're going to be saying, I'm here because I watched the message of hope through Joel on television, and you helped make that happen. I'm for real. And so thank you, especially, uh, you know, in the last year we've gone on uh, secular markets, the top 40 markets in this country, and, and the unchurched and unbelievers that are responding to the message of Christ is unbelievable. So when you go to bed on Sunday night, just know you are making a difference because of the covenant that we have. And so on behalf of Lakewood Church, Champions Network, and Pastor Joel and Victoria, uh, greetings. We love you. And your pastor is very, very important to pastor. And I understand that they have, uh, this is Joel's latest book, You Are Stronger Than You Think. It just came out a couple of days ago. And uh, how many would like to have this? So they're out in the lobby, they told me. And uh, you can get one. But anyway, they wanted me to mention that to you. But we're just, just very honored to be here. And the time that I have, I want to be obedient to God and um, to impart something into you today. I want to talk to you today about you matter. These are words that I pray that will be spoken to you and resonating deep in your spirit, more than just a casual, okay, but that you would let those words really resonate inside your spirit, I matter, you matter. And now more than ever in the culture that we're living in, each one of us need to be able to align ourselves with that calling, with that sense of purpose in our lives. Your pastor is really, in many ways, though you have experienced great growth in this church is continuing to enlarge its sphere, we really haven't seen anything yet. There is about to come a move of God in this country like we have never, ever experienced it. And the mandate of purpose and the mandate that we matter will never be more important than it is right now in this season. Everybody just say with me, I matter. I matter. matter. You know, one of the scriptures that I love, and I'm going to take you and tell you a story about a man that you know about, but this tonight I want you to own it. I want you to take on the story of this man and see you in it. But one of the great scriptures that I have built my life upon is in Acts 17, and I'm calling an audible right now, so don't panic, uh, media team. But the Bible says in Acts 17, and I'm going to paraphrase, the Bible says that it is God who predetermined when you would be born, where you would be born, and by whom you would be born through, because you didn't come from your parents. You came through your parents. Because the real you existed in a way that I cannot comprehend, certainly cannot communicate. That before time began, God knew you. You were somewhere near God. God had an idea of who you were and what you would become. And he matched your DNA with your destiny. You are not an accident. You didn't pick when, where, and by whom. God did. (laughs) 
And if you grasp that, it will align you with hearing and understanding your purpose. Let's talk about that. The story is about, that I want to tell you for a few minutes, is the story of John the Baptist. How many has ever heard of John the Baptist? John the Baptist is, is, is someone that we hear and preach about, but prophetically, I want you to understand that this story relates to you and to our season now more than ever. So before we go there, chapter uh, 1 of John, and we're going to go through there, and we're going to come to realize five things that you must know about yourself. When you say the term, I matter, there are five things you must know about yourself, and they come from this passage of John the Baptist. But please allow me to just set up a little backdrop. When John the Baptist came on the scene, there had been silence for 400 years. There had been no prophet. There had been no priest. There had been no thus saith the Lord. There had been nothing from God. It was completely silence. And during that time, there was a tremendous amount of oppression. And now, for the Jewish people who once were uh, experiencing great uh, dominion and influence, had now come under the influence of the Roman Empire, and morals were on a free fall, and morale was virtually evaporating, and everything had just become crooked, and the valleys deeper than ever, and the mountains higher than ever could be climbed. It was a very difficult time, and then came this sound, this voice, this passion, this calling, this I matter moment of John the Baptist. And when he came on, he was to fulfill what the prophet had said some 700 years before. There shall come a voice as one from the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And in that calling and in that voice, the crooked path will be made straight. And the deep valleys that people have been in shall be lifted high. And the mountains that they could not overcome shall be brought low. That is the setup for our text. And I think it's so important to recognize that that's where we are as a world, as a country, as a nation, as a community. Some 14, 15 months ago, the world changed. Not just America, but all 192 nations were immediately impacted by something that has now released so many side effects that the world is spinning. And if ever the paths were crooked, they are now. If ever the valleys were so deep with oppression and depression and a sense of being bewildered and lost, they are now. If there were ever mountains that we feel that we cannot climb, it is now. But I've come with a word, a prophetic word to tell you, you are a voice crying out. This church is a voice crying out, prepare. Oh, don't do that. Oh, Lord. I'll start preaching myself in, into exhaustion. So you're in this story. This is you. So when I go through this story and I talk about John the Baptist for a few minutes, I want you to say, that's you in your mind. This is me. This is me. This is what I need to uh, grab a hold of. John the Baptist was called by Christ the greatest person to ever live. I'm putting that on you tonight. I matter, I matter, I matter. I could have been born a hundred years ago, but I've been born for such a time. I matter. Here are the five things you should know about yourself. That you can come into an alignment with such a time as this. The scripture tells us, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but the, the questions and the dialogue that the Pharisees had with John the Baptist. And I can go to my Bible, I can go to this one. Is it coming on the screen? I'm waiting for it. There we go. I'll look here. And the priest asked him, this is John the Baptist they're talking to. 
and he's causing quite a scene and there's something beginning to happen and they're trying to figure it out. They ask the first question in the text, who are you? Everybody say, who are you? That's something that you must know. The second question that they asked was, they said, are you the prophet? Are you the prophet Elijah? And that's the second thing you must know. You must know who you're not. I need to know who I am. I need to know who I'm not. The third question was, so what do we tell the people when we go back to our rulers? Who do you say that you are? What are we to say that this is who you are and who you're not? This is important because it's a little tweaking of point one and point two. Who are you? You need to know that. Number two, who you're not. You need to know that. Number three, you need to know how to say who you are and who you're not. This is a bit awkward because this feels a, a bit little presumptuous and it feels a little pretentious to say, well, this is who I am. But it's important that you are able to look in the mirror and to see past all of the images, all the voices, all of the different things that try to get in your head and look in that mirror and say, I know who I am, I know who I'm not, and I know how to say who I am and who I'm not. The fourth question they ask is, why? Why are you here? And that's the most important of the five. What is your why? Why are you here? If God really thinks of you, like Jeremiah 29, 11 says, if God not only thinks of you, now, pause for a second. Time out. That went right over your head there. I want you to imagine for a moment, God thinks about you. Yeah, if God had a, 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 a screensaver, your picture would be on it. God, the creator of the universe. God, what are you doing? I'm thinking. What are you thinking about? Phil Munsley. He's thinking about you. Now, you're thinking right now there's 7 billion people. And come on, Phil, get real. Get, come on, this is all hype. Uh, what do you mean God can? Yeah, God can think about you as if you are the only one on the planet. My wife and I, Jeannie, we've been married 43 years. And, and, and somebody asked me once, said, what's it like being married to the same woman for 43 years? I said, I have no idea. She's been at least seven different women. <laughs> and I got the best version of her right now. But when we had our first child, she had the first child I participated. It was a beautiful experience of Kara coming into the world. And when Kara, my daughter, came into the world, she owned me immediately. She filled my heart. I loved her. I, 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 my world was obsessed. It was like, Kara, oh baby, Kara, I love you so much. You're everything to me. And then 14 months later, my son, Philip II, I liked him so much, I named myself after him. <laughs> and when he came into the world, I was like, oh, Philip, Oh, man, I love you so much. I love you more than anybody in the world. Kara, I love you. And then five years later, Andrew came into the world. Andrew, oh, Andrew, I love you. I love you more than anybody in the world. Philip, Kara. And then 13 years ago, we had our first grandchild. Grandchildren are God's reward for you not killing your kids. And I don't know what kind of love I had for my children, but it was quickly eclipsed by the love I have for my grands. Point being, if my feeble little infinite 
human ability can love somebody uniquely as if they're the only one. I'm telling you, please hear me. God Almighty thinks about you. He thinks, uh, he is obsessed with you. You reflect an image and a likeness of him no one has ever, ever, ever reflected. He not only thinks of you, he thinks good of you. I'm just honored he thinks of me. But he thinks good. It's like, I like Phil. I'm thinking good. I'm like, man, I'm not on your nerves. God thinks of, and not only does God think of me, not only does God think good of me, but God put much thought into me. This I want you to get. That God thought it all through. That he started from the beginning and to the end. And then figured out a way to weave you in through the DNA of history. And place you where you are. So on a Tuesday night. Right now whether you're watching me. Or, and you're watching me. Get back on that couch and watch me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that you would get this sense that my life matters. And please don't confuse purpose with prosperity or popularity. It's a, it's a sad commentary to think that our value is based upon how much money we have or how many people know our name. Can I tell you, those are the least important. In fact, purpose rarely is synonymous with prosperity and popularity. I'm not saying God wants you to be poor. I'm a prosperous believer in all of that. But my God, we've got to get beyond thinking that that's how we measure our value. You are valued in who you are, what you're doing, and how God has placed you in this moment. You're not competing against anybody. The only person you're competing against is the person you were yesterday. And all you got to do is just tweak just a little bit. Just every day say, I can do better today. I, I, I can open myself up to the possibilities of God's favor on my life. Just a little more. You see, own the this is who I am. In the short period of time that we're able to connect with each other, when I ask you, who are you? I'm asking you to value you, to understand that you matter. You matter to God. That your life has value. There is a subtle and not so subtle movement on our planet that is sending signals of human life doesn't matter. There is a subtle message to young people that is saying that you are an accident, that you're not really anybody of significance, and your sense of identity is being challenged. The enemy is always trying to rob us of our identity from the garden, from the garden when Adam and Eve were in the, in the garden. And, and, and the enemy was putting confusing thoughts. If you eat of that tree, you'll be like God. What do you mean? I'm already like God. I was made like God. If you eat of that tree, you'll have all of this dominion and power. What do you mean? I already have it. The ideal is to confuse your identity. And when God came into the garden to look for Adam and Eve, and he said, where are you? That was not a geographical question. It wasn't like God was saying... Where, what? It was a positional question. I gave you dominion. I gave you value. I told you the earth was yours. Where are you? We're over here naked and ashamed. And God said, who told you? That's the question I'm asking you. Who told you you don't matter? Who told you you're just taking up space and oxygen? Who told you that there's not a destiny connected to every day of your life? Know who you are. Know that you're valued by God. Know your value because no one else 
will and can give you that. Only you can set the price tag on the value of who you are. Nobody's coming to do that for you. Know who you are. Know who you're not. The worst thing that can happen is the Bible says that there are strongholds that work against our life and those strongholds come from images and those images come from thoughts and we are bombarded constantly with images that we're compared with. I, I think about my daughter, you know, with three kids and, and, and running into the store to get a gallon of milk. Back in my day, you could lead the kids in the car. <laughs> you youngins don't know that, but back in those days, they didn't have camera phones that videoed kids in the back seat of the car. We didn't even have safety seats. We didn't have safety. We played on the floor of the oxygen rusted <laughs> Gary, Indiana steel mill. How we lived, I don't know. How we survived, I don't know, but somehow we did. <laughs> You're sitting there in line trying to say, oh, these kids are screaming and they're yelling, they're pulling it, everything, and I got a spot here and I got this and I didn't put any makeup on and then you're right next to the grocery stand and there's a model there looking right there on the magazine. I mean, she's like perfect and you're like, oh, that's pretty. I'm ugly. That's the way you're supposed to look, not the way I am. Let me just tell you something. I live in Southern California and those people don't look like that in real life. I mean, they got 17 people doing makeup on them for five or six hours. And then they got a fan blowing on their hair. And then they, and then they photo brush that. <laughs> Don't be intimidated. Amen. Know who you are. No, I'm not Elijah, he said. No, I am not the Christ. No, I'm not. Maybe some of the most powerful words you'll ever say. That's not my lane. That's not my grace place. I'm not supposed to be like them. That's not who I am. I know who I am. I know who I'm not. And then to constantly articulate it. Now this is where most of you are going to check out on this. Because you're going to think, why do I need to do this? In the corporate world, they call it your elevator pitch. You ever heard that? It's the idea that you get in an elevator with your boss or with somebody that has the power to give you and make things happen for you. They have the ability to say, yes, you got the job. Yes, you get the promotion. Yes, you get the title. And you got 90 seconds when that door closes to make your pitch. And if you make it right, boom, the future is yours. If you blow it, you blow it. And that's called a, a, an elevator pitch. I want to tell you, this is important for you to be able to chisel away, fine-tune the rough edges until you can say in 90 seconds who you are and who you're not and whom do men say that you say that you are. Get it. It's going to feel weird in the beginning. You're going to not even be convinced as you look in the mirror. I am... No, oh, gee, no, I'm not. <laughs> but you own it because you say it, because you know he, who needs, needs to hear that. Certainly God will open up doors for you. And when that door opens, you've got to be ready to say, this is who I am, this is who I'm not. This is what I say that I am and what I'm not and my why. But you know who needs to hear it more than anyone? You do. You need to hear yourself say, I'm valuable. I'm called, I'm gifted, I have a unique calling upon my life. This is who I am, this is who I'm not, and this is what I say about who I am and who I'm not. And, and then find your why, this is your cause. And you don't have to over-romance it, you just have to listen, it's right there. Your dreams give you hints of God's plan and call for your life, it's not that mysterious. It's just right there. If you could just quiet the noise and quiet the competition and the sounds and the images that are constantly being thrown at you, it's right there. Your why is in the desires of your heart. The Bible says that God gives you the desires of your heart. Oh, 
I think you thought I said God gives you the desires of your heart. I, I didn't say God gives you the desires of your heart. I said God gives you the desires of your heart. See, you didn't get it. Some of you are still hearing me say God gives you the desires of your heart. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying God gives you the desires of your heart. That was a PGA clap. You didn't get it yet. That's okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm not upset. I understand. It sounds a little confusing. No, God gives you the desi- desires of your heart. See, God gives you the desires of your heart to desire so that when you desire the desires that he desires you to desire, then he gives you the desires that he desired you to desire that you desired, and now he gives you those desires. Don't make me say this again. I'm getting myself confused myself. So trust it. Trust it. Trust it. You say, but, you know, how do I know it's vain? How do I know it's not ego? How do I know? You know how you tell the difference between a dream and a scheme? One simple question. Is this a dream? Is this God giving me hints? Is this my GPS going off telling me this is what God wants me because I want it? That's what God wants because I'm desiring it. It's what God wants me to desire. One simple question. If, the, if it comes true, who benefits the most? Others are you. If at the end of this thought process you have, you're the only one that benefits, it's a scheme. Don't waste your life following it. But if inside you, your dream makes the world better, if you're going to be the John the Baptist that makes the crooked path straight and brings the valley up and the mountains down so that everyone can see this is the way. Oh, yeah, you're hearing it. You find your why in your desires. You find your why in, in what makes you tick. You find your, desi- your, your why in, in, in a word that we misunderstand a lot. And that is you find your calling from your passion. And we all want passion. We all desire passion. I actually buy on occasions. I know I shouldn't. But I buy often five-hour energy. Because I'm like, I need passion to get through this day. <laughs> and somehow we think that passion is this emotional uh, gush of, of energy we feel. But passion actually sneaks up on us and we miss hearing its power and its force. Because the word passion actually comes from the word that means to have suffered or to have been vexed. You ever heard of the movie The Passion of the Christ? It means the suffering of the Christ. So on one hand, you should feel the tension of what you desire, what you want, what you dream of. And then you should feel the tension of where does it hurt? Where's your pain? Where's that pain that won't go away? You've had counseling therapy. You've done everything you can, but it doesn't go away. That pain is talking to you. That pain is saying to you, I'm going to make purpose come out of that pain. I'm going to take that pain, and I'm going to make sure that nobody else feels that pain like you did because you're going to be the solution to that pain. I'm going to make that a part of your calling. And when you take that which makes you mad and hurts you and that which makes you happy and is your desire, in that tension, you will find your why. Pull on it. Find it because it's not far from you at all. This is your voice. This is you, John the Baptist. This is your part. And lastly, they asked him, who follows you? And of course, John the Baptist's response was, oh, he that comes after me is greater than me. And of course, it was the Messiah. But do you know that you have a following? Do you know that your life means something not just for you and now, but... All of us have a legacy. In fact, dreams grow up to become legacies. At some point, dreams, like children, awaken us. And like youth, they fuel us. There comes a point in time when you put away youthful lust. And I'm not talking about sensual and physical. I'm talking about desires that are obsessed with just here and now. And at some point, you step into the role of a mother, of a father, of a legacy torch carrier 
and you recognize it's not just about me and it's not just about now, but it's about a legacy and what follows me. And this is when your purpose grows up and takes on meaning. This is where you recognize that in every deed there is a seed. And maybe nobody else sees what you did right and nobody else sees how you avoided the wrong. And nobody sees it. But can I tell you, your heavenly Father sees it. In fact, what God, what man rewards, God doesn't. What man does not reward, God does. And the things that you do in secret, and the things that you do that are for the next and not for just now, you will find yourself connected to a depth and a purpose. And I close with this. As an individual, you must know that you matter. And in spite of the fact that God has given our pastors a prophetic voice, and that voice is beyond a zip code, that voice that God has given our pastor is going to transcend zip codes. And it's going to find its way in states and nations. And we all get to be a part of that. But if you don't have your voice, your calling, if you're not walking in yours, then they're just words. But when you step into your destiny, then we become a force. And I want to prophesy and say this to you. And I get some of my time back because you were clapping in several times. <laughs> you're so kind. As we step into an understanding that it's not just that I matter. It's not that I know who I am, yes, and I know who I'm not, and I know how to say who I am, and I know my why, but I step into a community of believers, and I say, we're in this together. This is not just about me. This is why church attendance and church commitment and church accountability is so important, because everything you're building for, your wealth, your health, all of the dreams you have, if there's no one to take those dreams and keep them on the earth and manage them for generations to come, then really the four don't matter if you don't get the fifth. If there is no one following you, John the Baptist, then though you're the greatest ever, it won't matter. And legacies are from the womb of church community. I can tell you the church has never been more needed than now. And it was just, watch, I'm going to get serious for a moment. And those of you that are watching me, I know I'm speaking this in love. And as soon as I get done, I'm running out of here. <laughs> never has assembling ourselves together been more important than now. Yes. You think about what the enemy did. The enemy did something. And there's nothing we could have done about it. All we could do is respond. It was our plight. It was our night. But the greatest thing the enemy can do is to take people driven with purpose and isolate them from one another. The worst thing the enemy can do is to put something between us so that we're not able to use our gifts to, full, to feed and to fuel and to multiply. You see, there's a thing called synergy. It's called synergy. It, it works like this. Here's the best illustration. A two by four can hold 30 pounds of pressure. So you can count on it holding 30 pounds of pressure. If you get another two by four and nail them together, it would hold not 60 pounds, but 90. That's the science of synergy. Whoa, that doesn't make sense. 30 and 30 is 60. But no, when you put them together, it creates synergy. When God's people put their purpose, their dream, their calling, and they unite in accountability, we become a force that is unstoppable. And I prophesy this over you right now. I'm done preaching. Now I want to prophesy. Soon the tower, hear me now, you must not hear from here, but from here. Soon the tower of Babel shall tip. 
Soon, the attacks, the confusion, the destructive, subtle behavior to turn us against each other, it will soon tip. Even now, as God told Gideon, you will see the enemy turn on each other. Pay attention. Judgment has come. Exposure comes. The first thing that God does when he judges is expose. It's not worse. He's just putting light on it. After he puts exposure to it, then he puts a demand for elimination so he can set us up for elevation. I prophesy the Tower of Babel in confusion is about the tip. Babylon is falling. And when it does, the nations are going to be looking for someone that has a voice that says, we know who we are. We know who we're not. We know what we say about who we are. And for this reason, I am anointed because I have a why inside of me. Faith Church has a why inside of them. You better keep buying land. You better keep growing. You better keep dreaming. We are that voice. Come on and give God a praise. Give God a praise. In 1998, I had a vision. I saw the future. I saw what was going to happen. And I saw that if we, as we would come into the 50th generation of Christianity, we would have a generation of Jubilee. It would be like nothing we've ever experienced before. In that vision, I heard these words and I wrote them down like I was just, uh, 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 just taking, uh, someone's dictating somebody's words. And I wrote these down. I'm going to let you see them. And then I'm going to close with us all making this confession. But this is what I believe God has called Faith Church, called our pastors to, called us to, called us to our purpose, but it's called us to come together with our purpose. And this is what I wrote in that moment of seeing the future. For 10 minutes being caught up in this vision, I wrote this down. If they'll put it on the screen. I'd like to read it and then you read it with me. The Legacy Confession. Is it there, guys? It's not. Oh, wow. Can I read it to you? Will you give me just 30 seconds? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here. I feel the Holy Ghost. This is what he gave me. And you'll hear these words. And when I do, I'll just prophesy it over you. I am a part of the local church with my time, talent, and treasures. Together, we are the express body of Christ. I am committed to covenant relationships. I welcome authority and accountability. I will not let selfish, short-term, superficial attitudes destroy my family and friends. I will prosper. It is a healthy sign that I am a part of the kingdom of God. I will create wealth with the power God gave me, and I will be a channel of wealth for my God and for my seed. I will be the solution to the, sol to the social and spiritual pollution. This is my Father's world. The educational, ecological, economical, entertainment environment is my responsibility. This is my mandate. This is my ministry. This is my mission. I will serve my generation well. Would you just put your hands out like this? Put your eyes towards me. I declare today to those of you that are watching around the country, Florida, our different church locations, to those that are here, look at me. You you were called. You, you matter. Get it all aligned in your head and in your heart and step into it. And I prophesy that God will use this church and he will use our pastors as a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. 
and those crooked, jaded paths that have left so much damage for our generation shall be made straight. And those valleys that have sucked in a generation of oppression, depression, anxiety, and pain shall be lifted. And those mountains of oppression, injustice, that have been so high we haven't been able to climb them shall be brought low. I release to you in this church and everyone that walks into these doors and that touches this church to step into a time of destiny. You matter. You are anointed in Jesus' name. Give God praise. Thank you.